Thank you, Jonathan. I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 3 through 7, as we continue along uh, verse by verse. Uh, I want you to know, as we've been going uh, from Ephesians 4, really about verse 24, uh, all the way to where we are today, I, I want us to understand what the message of it is. I, I don't want you to be like the congregation I heard of this past week. The pastor thought he would do a visual demonstration. And what he did was he got four jars and he put it at the front and each jar he put a worm. And in the first jar he put alcohol in it. In the second jar he put cigar smoke and cigarette smoke. In the second jar, in the third jar he put chocolate because he wanted to teach about, hey, overeating, don't want to do that. And in the fourth jar he put good soil for the worm. He got up there and man, he preached his heart out. He shook the corn, he went to town. And he got through at the end of the service and he said, well, I'm gonna use this visual demonstration. And he showed the congregation the first worm that was in the alcohol, dead. Second one that was in the cigar smoke, cigarette smoke, dead. Third one that was in the chocolate, dead as a doorknob. Then the fourth one that was in the good soil was alive. And so he was like, oh, this work. Congregation, what can we learn from this visual demonstration today? And this sweet, sweet, sweet saint, back in the back, she was over 90 years old. She, she raised her hand. She said, Pastor, I've learned if you don't drink, I mean, if you drink, you smoke, and you eat chocolate, you won't get worms. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I've learned that if you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't get worms. That's it. That's it. Don't be like that congregation that gets the wrong message. Because what I want you to understand is when we're going through Ephesians 4, 24 through, through 5, really until next week, and the series we've been looking at is, is walking as children of light. I don't want you to get the wrong message that Christianity is a bunch of do's and don'ts. I, I know I came up, and my, that's really what I thought Christianity was. Don't do these certain things that are on this list, and if you do these things, then that's, that's what it means to be a Christian. I, I think you're seeing from Ephesians 4 that it's so much more than that. It's being born from above. It's being changed from the inside out. And, and as Paul told us in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, it, it's putting off the old, putting off who you used to be, and putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And how do we do that? It's by walking in the Spirit, but putting on that new man is created. It is created by God. So you're a new creation. So we are to walk as children of light. Now, here's the thing. If you haven't noticed yet, in the world... It will try to dim your light. It, 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 walking as children of light is something that requires your every effort. It requires you making sure that your light is burning bright. And so we've been looking for the past couple weeks of what it means to walk as a child of light. Today, I'm going to give you three, three, three actions, if you will, that will help you to maintain, to burn bright, to make sure that that light for Christ inside of you is shining bright. So today is how to keep that light shining. Because truth of it is, it is a challenge. Now, we earlier we uh, Matthew read the text. Before we before we jump into it, before we pray, uh, I do just want to give just a maybe a warning, maybe a little bit of an asterisk out beside it. Normally, I preach a G sermon. All right, G rated. Uh, today, if you'll read verse 3, you'll see that I may be more PG, okay? So, uh, uh, not PG-13, but we will be more PG because we're going to have to deal with some things that the text is dealing with. I promise you, parents, I'm going to do my best that you're not going to have to have a long, long talk afterwards, all right? <laughs> if I can help it. All right, so with that in mind, let's pray to that. No, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, when we get there, I'll share it. But let's pray. Father... Bless this message. Uh, Lord, bless the reading of your word. Thank you for your text. And Lord, I pray that we would walk as children of light. But Lord, we would do everything we can to maintain that fire, to make sure that we are burning bright. In a world that is so dark, in a world that is so sinful and filthy, may we stand out as children of light. So Lord, that's going to require us each and every day to commit ourselves, each and every day to put off and put on. So Lord, I pray that we would do that. And above all, Lord, be glorified in this message today. Lord, I pray that the uh, meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight. These things I ask and pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. If you're going to keep this light shining bright, if you're going to be one that through no matter how filthy and dark the world is, that you're going to shine for Christ, there are a couple of things you need to make sure you do. Number one is this. You need to flee flame extinguishers. You, you got to run from things that are going to put out or dim your light. That's what he's talking about in verses 3 through 4. In these two verses, Paul is going to list out six different sins. Now, the way I'm going to look at it is we're going to categorize it into three different sins and kind of uh, list out what, what is under each one. Now, I, I want you to know something. The one thing that came out as I was studying verses 3 and 4, and, and this is the thing that was so amazing to me. This was written 2,000 years ago. Folks, we, we, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The same wickedness that we deal with is the same wickedness they dealt with in Ephesus. We, we've just learned how to be more creative with it. In, in other words, we, we've, we've learned how to be a little more depraved, but they still had immorality, they had impurity, they had the same things that we are dealing with. Now, be careful with this text, because if you'll look at verses 5 and 6, we won't be hitting on those as much today. But I want you to know, as you look at verses 5 and 6, it, it is one that you could say, well, wait a minute, Ben. I read verses 5 and 6, and then, wait, wait a second, if I have one sin of immorality or one sin of impurity or, or, or one course jesting? Does that mean I'm headed to hell? That, that's not what this text is teaching. That's not what the New Testament teaches. Well, what this text is teaching, verses 5 and 6, is this. As a child of God and as a born-again believer, well, what is being mentioned in verses 3 through 4? It's not to be in your life. It, it, it doesn't mean that we as Christians are sinless. That, that's not what it's teaching. But what it does teach is that we sin less. Make sense? We're not sinless, but we do sin less because as a child of God, someone who's been born again, 1 John 3, 9 and 10, we, we don't want to walk in darkness. We want to walk in light. So, so be careful with that. So with that in mind, I, I want you to see, I believe he's going to give us three categories. Three categories of things that will diminish, things that will lessen how bright you burn for Christ. The first one is letter A is this, is sexual sin. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, this is what I was, I was been nervous about all week because I know we, we've got some young people in the crowd. Let, let me be the first to say this, parent. I know for, for my family, it was when they were 13 and 14 years old that we sat down and began to have a talk uh, with our children. I believe the way the world is heading right now, it, it always needs to be even younger. And it's something that we don't need to be scared to talk about because we need to make sure that we teach our children that it's it, that the God's pattern for how we are to interact and how we are to have relations. Now, why is it that he starts out with sexual sin? Well, think about last week. What did 5 1 and 5 2 tell us? Who are we to imitate in 5 1? We are, we're to imitate God, be imitators of God as dear children. In verse 2, he gives us an example of what it means to love like Christ loved. Isn't it interesting that he told us what it means to love like Christ, who gave himself for us. And, and it talks about how selfless he was, how it was unconditional, how, how it was giving. And then he turns right into sexual sin and how the world lives. Kind of the opposite of that, isn't it? Because if Christ is selfless, the world in false love is selfish. If Christ is unconditional, his love is unconditional, then the world in false love would be, oh, based on if you meet my needs and do these things, then, then you're accepted. In other words, true love, and what the Bible says that we should love like, loves to give. The world's love loves to gain. In other words, it's all about what I can get and what I can get for myself. And that's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, we're to flee from these things, run from them. In other words, as you look at verses 3 and 4, they're not fitted for your life. Have absolutely no hint of it whatsoever. Paul's not giving us wiggle room to say, oh, we can be a little bit this way. No, he is saying it is not even to be named among you. So it's so important that we maintain our purity, maintain our lives, and maintain our walk as children of light. 
Now, there's two categories he has under, under, the, under letter A. The first one, they both start with the letter I, which I love. It helps my outline so easily. Is immorality. Now, if you think about what immorality is, you, you can think, well, that covers a whole broad spectrum of, uh, of what can be defined under there. And that's why it's so important that we always look at the Greek and how Paul used that word because it is translated fornication in other places. But the Greek word is pornea. Well, you can get where, where we get some of our words from today, from pornea. But, but it means, I think it means something a little more specific. And, and the reason I, I know this is because as you study where Paul uses this same term, it will help us to understand what he's talking about. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 is a passage where Paul uses this same word. And he says, because of the temptation to immorality, pornea, each man should have his own wife and each her own husband. Understand that. He's not talking about adultery there because you're not married. So that in other words, to avoid the temptation and fall into the sin of pornea, then you should marry. So he's not talking about adultery. Well, what he's talking about, and this is what's so important. God has set boundaries for what is right. And I'll be the first to tell you, man, this, this is a topic that makes me sweat when I have to talk about it in front of people. But really we shouldn't. Because it is a gift from God. But here's the thing. That gift is to be enjoyed under certain boundaries. And those boundaries are none before marriage. That's what he's getting at with immorality. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, don't be tempted by it. Instead, marry. So, so in other words, God has given us the boundaries for what is right and what is proper. Anything outside of those boundaries is what he's getting at as being immoral. And that's what we need to teach our children. And say, look, here is what is a beautiful thing, these relations. But they are to be enjoyed under the confines of Christian marriage and only under the confines of Christian marriage. And Christian marriage is defined as one man and one woman loving each other till death do them part. Amen. And I know, I know that is not a popular thing these days. But again, I'm not going for popularity, I'm going for truth. Amen. It's what God sets out for us. And so we are to flee immorality, not to have it anywhere in our lives. But the second one he has is this. He has impurity. Now, immorality deals with those boundaries that he has inside of marriage, that it should be inside of marriage and only inside of marriage. Well, impurity covers a whole lot more than just immorality. Impurity has to do with rottenness is how you would, how you would uh, define it if you were to uh, take that word from the Greek and translate it. It has to do with moral corruption. It, it, it is an impure lifestyle that dishonors God. It disrespects his word. It, it has disregard for the commands of Christ. It, it respects nothing. And all it cares about it is satisfying itself. It's a life that's committed to immoral and improper things. The best way to do it is if we think about immorality covers basically marriage, impurity covers our thought life, our fantasies, our passions. It covers how we talk. It basically covers everything. And, and an impure person it is someone who is dedicated to fulfilling the flesh. It is someone who is dedicated to fulfilling lust itself. Now, please understand this. Christianity, again, is not a bunch of thou shalt nots. But when God does say thou shalt not, what he's trying to tell you is thou shalt not hurt yourself. Because the second that you go outside of his standards, it's as, it's as if God created us, which he did. And it's as if God gave us the owner's manual, which is the scriptures. And this is how to have a successful life. This is how to have an abundant life. This is how not to harm yourself. And here are the boundaries. Here's what's right. Here's what's good. And when he says thou shalt not, he's saying don't hurt yourself. Instead, walk as a child of life. So we need to avoid sexual sin. But I want you to see, secondly, I, I believe there are some things that we need to flee because this will dim your life for Christ is selfishness. He defines it as greed in verse 3. Now, it, it, the first time that you hear the word greed, probably the first thing you think of is, oh, he's talking about money, materialism. 
you know, greed. I gotta have more. I, I want that. I want this. I gotta have the biggest car because Lord knows the the neighbor just bought a, bought bought one that's that hauls ten people. I gotta get one that hauls twelve. Or he bought my neighbor bought one that's got uh get it so fast. I gotta make sure that I have fast faster one. That that's not the kind of greed he's talking about. What's the context here? The context, as we talked about in verse three and four, has to do with sex and relationships. And, and, and so this selfishness, this greed, is, it has just as much to do with sex as it does with obtaining stuff. But if you'll notice in verse 5, when he talks about this, this sin of coveting and, and this sin of selfishness and wanting more, he compares it to idolatry. Here's why he compares it to idolatry. Because what happens is when, when we're discontented with what we have and, and we begin to want and want and want that and I want that and I want that, what can happen is that that which we want can become an object of worship. We become so consumed with it and so consumed with obtaining it that we take our eyes off God. It, it basically is becoming an idolater. And truth be known, every, every form of sexual impurity is a form of selfishness. It's a form of greed. And I've seen people basically say, I've got to have that. I don't care if it costs me my family. I don't care if it costs me my career. I, I don't care if it, if it costs who, whatever it costs. I don't care who it hurts because i got to go after that. I need that in my life. And that's why he's saying avoid that selfishness. Because that selfishness will keep you about making you and what you want more important than seeking God and honoring Him. It will dim your light. Sexual sin, selfishness, and I want you to see this, letter C, simple speech, verse 4. Man, if God wasn't already in your kitchen and in your wheelhouse, He just got in your face, didn't He? Because now it has to do with every, every idle word we talk. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I kind of talk a lot. I kind of joke a lot. I kind of pick with people. And, and the more that I read verse 3 or verse 4, I'm like, oh, no. We, we're going to be held accountable for every idle word we utter. That's what Jesus tells us. And, and so we have to watch what we say. Because here's the thing. If we, if we say things that are filthy, if we say things that are silly, if we say things that are coarse and rude, you know what that reveals? That reveals what your heart is. But because Jesus said it this way, it is from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So, so if your speech, Christian, born again, renewed from above, regenerated, walking in the new man, new creation, if, if your speech is just like the world and your, your speech is filled with cursing and putting down on people and filthiness and silliness, it just reveals that's where your heart is. And that's why he says, listen, we've got to guard our heart because out of it overflows the wellsprings of life. In other words, it's from our heart that our mouth speaks. It's where we think from, and, and it kind of determines which path we will take. But I think it's important that we define what, what, what is being said here so, so we understand it. The word filthiness, it, it, it refers to something that is ugly. Basically, it would, be, it would be filthy cursing is the best way to put it. It's something that disrespectful. It's dirty speech. It doesn't take much to understand what he's getting at there. I think the other one, the next one is probably the hardest one. Silly talk. <clears throat> S silly talk. Let me see if I can give you the Greek word for it because I think that would help us to understand what it is. The Greek word is the term moros. We have a name that we call sometimes people that maybe aren't so bright. You know what that term is? Moron. Moron, yeah. We, we might say, well, maybe you're just a moron. A moron. <coughs> and it's moron. Well, well, that's what it's getting at. It's the kind of talk that lacks intelligence. It's just talking for talking's sake. It's talking trying to be funny and being silly. And, and Paul is saying, look, that didn't need to be in your life. And then last but not least, I, best, I think the best way to define coarse jesting is, is uh, think about this. If you can, think back to when you were in the seventh grade. All right? Or better yet, think about being around seventh grade boys. All right? If you've ever been around seventh grade boys or maybe even sixth, eighth grade boys, the teacher might say something that is totally innocent, 
doesn't mean there's nothing, nothing tied to it that would make anybody think that is, that is something offhand. But that seventh grade boy, that eighth grade boy, if you're in seventh grade, eighth grade boy uh, here today, I'm not picking with you. I'm talking about the other 98%, right? <laughs> but, but, but the teacher says something that's just totally innocent. But that seventh grade boy, you know what he'll do? <laughs> she said, <laughs> and, and they try to make innuendos out of something that has no innuendo whatsoever. And Paul is saying, look, that doesn't need to be in your life. It's not suitable. It's not fit for you, born-again believer, you child of light, to make innuendos and try to make dirty things out of something that's not dirty. That, that doesn't fit for you. So you've got to protect your heart. You've got to protect your torch. Before we go further, though, let, let me just say this. I know it's easy to read verse 4 and think, well, well, God's just a buzzkill. He don't want us to laugh or joke or have fun. That's not it. Believe me, Ecclesiastes 13, 4 says there is a time to cry and there is a time to laugh. Yeah, and, and one of my favorite verses is Proverbs 17, 22. Proverbs 17, 22 says this, a merry heart does good like a medicine. In other words, a heart that loves that is more joyful and likes to carry on and laughs, it's like a medicine. It fits and it, it helps you to get through things. And so God's not saying, oh, you can't ever laugh and that can't ever carry on. No, if anything, he's saying that we need to enjoy life and enjoy one another. At the same time, we do it in a way that's not filthy, not silly, and not coarse in jesting. But I want you to see this. If you're going to keep that flame burning right, burning bright, you got to flee flame things. There's things that will dim it. But you also got to fuel the flame. You've ever built a fire in your backyard? Maybe it was a, just a, a, a thing to roast marshmallows over, a little campfire. You, you got to make sure that that fire gets plenty of air and it gets the right fuel, whether it's wood or whether it's air, to keep burning. Folks, it's the same way with you as a Christian. You've you got to make sure that you are fanning those flames, that you stay white hot for Christ. And the way to do that is found in verse 4b. Now, remember, as we've gone through chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul has said, put off these things and put on these. In other words, put off stealing and put on working. <laughs> Put, put off anger and put on love. And, and, and you'll remember, each one of these is always put off, but God always wants us to put in its place something else. So why does Paul tell us here, and I think it's important to really go through this, why is it Paul tells us to put off sinful sexual sins, sinful speech, and selfishness, and in place we put thankfulness? Well, why is that? I mean, I scratched my head all weekend, and I, I think there were three reasons I came up with the more I thought about it. I believe number one is this. A regenerated mind and a thankful heart is not an option for a born-again believer. Let me repeat that. A regenerated mind and a thankful heart, it is an absolute necessity for a child of God. Amen. If you're going to walk as a child of light, you've got to have a renewed mind. That renewed mind helps you to focus on the things that are above. It helps us to put off the old and put on the new. But you also have to have a thankful heart because a thankful heart, and here's the second reason is, thankfulness or thanksgiving breeds thankfulness. The more you're thankful for the little things, the more you're going to be thankful day by day by day. In other words, thankfulness needs to become a habit in your life. It needs to become part of who you are. And so I don't care if you've got to take little memo notes or build yourself a sign and put it over your door. If you've got to take and stick it on the dashboard where the speedometer is. But you put a note somewhere to remind yourself every day and every moment, give thanks. Why? Because that's what God's will for your life is. That's what he wants, is for us to be thankful in every situation. But I believe the main reason that Paul says put off sin, this sin, this, this sexual sin, this sinful speech, and this selfishness, and instead put on thankfulness is, what's at the very heart of being thankful? It's being content. It's being content with what God's given me. 
It's being content to say, God, I am so thankful with the wife that I have. I am so thankful with what you've blessed me with. And, 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 and that heart of contentment, if you can be content with what God has given you and be satisfied in that, whether it's the boundaries he has set for, for relations or, or whether it's the fact that you can be content with what you have in, in a home and in a, a wife, then you will not be discontented and begin to look elsewhere for something that might satisfy you. In other words, think about it this way. If when I'm content with my wife and I love her and I, 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 I am content with her and I'm thankful for her, I'm not going to be looking at someone else because I'm dissatisfied. It is a heart of contentment. And that's why Paul says, put off all those things and put on thankfulness. Because when you're thankful, and you appreciate all that God's given you, you you're not going to be discontented and want to find something else. But here's the truth of it. You've got to fuel that flame. You see, thankfulness is something that you, you need to be like the pastor I heard about that each and every day he would start his sermon with, I'm so thankful today, and he would put in a reason why he was thankful. Well, one day it happened that it was just dreary. It was one of those days it was raining and kind of half, half sleet and half raining. One of those days that, truth be known, if you cancel church, it had been about the same if you would had church. It might be you and about the pastor and about three other people. <laughs> well, the ushers are there and they said, mm-hmm, let's see old boy be thankful today. This is one of the days you just, nah, nah, he ain't going to be able to do it today. So he stood up in front of the pool, uh, got up in the pulpit, and he said, let's pray. And this is what he prayed. Lord, I'm thankful not every day is like today. <laughs> you know, it takes, it takes work to be thankful. Sometimes you're going to have to look for it, the reason to be thankful. But let me encourage you, child of God, make every effort to be a thankful person. Because when you're thankful, it breeds more thanksgiving. And when you become more and more thankful, the beauty of it is you'll be content with what you have. And you won't be trying to satisfy it somewhere else. Reference verse 3, verse 4. But I want you to see, I believe there's a third step. If you're going to burn bright for Christ, if you're going to have this, this light inside that shines in the darkness, you've got to fellowship with flame fanners. You've got to fellowship with flame fanners. Now, the reason I'm going to preach it, teach it this way is, I'm going to take what verse 7 says, and I'm just going to apply the opposite. If this is true, therefore, do not be partakers with those who walk in these sexual sins, these selfish sins, and these silly speech. If you're going to not walk with them, then who should you walk with? Well, other children of light. Amen. That, that word partakers there in verse 7, it means to be partners. It means to, to come along beside. It means to participate in. It means to throw your hat in with them. In other words, folks, I want you to understand what Paul is saying here. Because you've been born again and because you are different, you will stick out from the rest of the world. You will not be participating with what they participate. Instead, if you really want to fan that flame and you want to be a bright light for Christ, find you somebody else who loves Jesus just as much, if not more than you do, and you draw close to them and you disciple one another and you encourage one another to love and good deeds. Because just like that ember in the fireplace, by itself, it's hot. Put another one with it, it just keeps getting hotter. Put it in a hearth full of people who are on fire, and man, that thing will stay hot for hours upon hours upon hours. The same thing is true for you, Christian. You are not called to be a long range of Christian because you can't. If you're going to burn bright for Christ, you need other people around you who are just as passionate, just as much in love with Christ. Because the more that you gather with people like that, the brighter you'll burn as well. Amen. One more note before we go from there. Do not take this verse 7 and me preaching to say, oh, then we're not to have anything to do with the world. That's not what I'm saying. Because Paul himself said, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. Yeah. In, in other words, folks, how are they going to hear the gospel if we're not around them? This is not saying totally ignore them, don't have anything to do with them. This is saying show them who and what the light of the world is. Show them Christ without participating in what they do. You can do that. And we are to show that light. This morning, the invitation is going to be simple. 
Maybe today you, you haven't been a thankful person. Oh, you, you might once in a while thank the Lord, but are you truly thankful to where, man, I could be content with where I am and what I have? And while the singers will come in just a minute, this is a time for you to, maybe it's time just to say thank you, Lord. Or maybe you just need to do an examination this morning. Maybe you look at number one and you're beginning to realize, man, I, I've got too much stuff in my life that's dimming my light for Christ. I, I can't burn bright for Christ. I've got too much sin in my life. This morning, these altars are open, or maybe you can just stay right where you are and you do business with God. Or maybe, just maybe, you need to find someone who's going to encourage you in Christ. Or maybe you're burning bright. Who do you need to be around to help them burn brighter as well? Folks, I, I don't know if you know this, but we are living in a very dark time. Oh, I'm not talking about coronavirus. That's that in itself is bad enough. L look at where we are morally as a country. I believe we are on a, a tipping point, if you will. It's almost as if we're on a, a, a seesaw and we're going to go one way or the other. And, and I just think that the, the passing of uh, the uh, Chief Justice Ginsburg, I, I, I really believe that's just a uh, just another little brick on, the, on, on, the, on that wall that's being built up. This country can go either way. And I know the tensions are high. And the more that I look at the news and the more that I see the world, it's getting darker and darker. And my call to you, church, if there's ever been a time that we show the love of Christ and we show what it means to live as light in a dark place, it's now. Amen. And it is time that we take serious fleeing from flame extinguishers, fueling the fire, fueling that flame that we have for Christ, and fellowshipping with, with flame fanners. Because, folks, if we're going to burn bright for Christ, it's got to start now. And it needs to start in a hurry. Amen. Because the world is getting darker and darker. You be that light. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this morning, Lord, you would be honored in all that's said and done. Father, in this time of, uh, of dedication and time of invitation, would you speak to our hearts? And above all, Father, may we walk as children of light. Not, not participating in those things that classify what the world is. No, we don't partake in those. But instead, we, we walk as different people because we've been changed from the inside out. We've been renewed from above. And Lord, I pray that we would fan that flame. Lord, that our hearts would be so thankful for everything you've blessed us with because the more thankful we are, the less discontented we'll be. We will be content in all that you've given us. So Lord, this is your time. Speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.